I now return to the end of my active service on October the 3rd. The enemy were in rapid retreat, and we must follow. I was detailed to make a reconnaissance and report on the best route, taking shell holes and other obstructions into account, for our battery of heavy guns to go forward on the 4th. I was mounted with an orderly riding a few yards behind me. And I had not gone more than a mile or so, when consulting the map, I saw that it was essential for me to ride over the crest of a hill in view of the enemy. To do such a thing violated the thing. But I had no option. Anyhow, it was a quiet morning, little sound of gunfire, so I hadn't a great deal of cause for anxiety. However, I put my horse into a trot to go over the crest. As I reached it, I heard a gun. It didn't occur to me that it was any concern of mine until I sensed that the shell was coming away my way. In a second or so, I knew I must have been the target. I found myself sitting on the road, twenty feet or so, from the prostrate, motionless, bleeding body of my horse. Blood streaming from my head, my left arm in an obvious mess, and a large lump of flesh gouged out of my left thigh. My orderly and his horse were unharmed. He just stood gaping. I lost my power of speech. I just managed to say, Go! help, and they galloped off down the hill. Stretcher bearers came running up and carried me to a regimental aid post where my aid wounds were examined and bandaged. I remember the doctor saying cheerfully, Ha ha, you'll soon be back in dear old Blighty. Charles Ruth told me many weeks later what happened when my orderly returned to the battery and found the officers at lunch in their underground officers' mess. He reported that I had been badly wounded and taken away on a stretcher and that my horse had been killed. Major B's only comment was, Oh, has the saddle been salved? In that day, which seemed so long, I was removed from the lines in seven stages. The wounded man was not made to go far without medical attention. From the regimental aid post, I was taken still on a stretcher to the advanced dressing station. There, I have a vivid recollection of being given a bunch of black grapes, which are consumed lying flat on my back. My right hand, caked with dried blood, holding them above my mouth. I had to report that I was being slowly roasted, and the heat on which I had been deposited was reduced. At this time, I was in some pain, and I had to suffer a very uncomfortable journey in a rattle-trap ambulance over an appallingly bad road. My next call was the main dressing station, where I was more thoroughly examined by a young New Zealand doctor. I admit he was a perfect man for his job. His cheerful, reassuring manner made me feel better. Again, I was on my back, by my head, 
he said cheerfully, Ah, oh, you were straight up here. No fracture, nothing to worry about. In the middle of this, I felt a sudden, sharp pain in my head, showing me an ugly shell splinter with a deep protruding from my skull. He said, Sorry to hurt you, but it had to come out. It was much better not to warn you. I was grateful, and I wonder if we should like to thank you. After 30 years of war, doctors were still not tired of treating patients with wonderful sympathy. Their emotion would have made their lives impossible. Lying near me was a poor devil groaning with pain. His groan became faint and stopped. When the doctor came, he muttered, and an expression in his voice died of wounds. I wondered how many times a day he had to say that, but how lucky I was. Yes, when one is wounded, there can be a great deal of luck in the consequences. And I was extremely A young officer I knew in England was killed by a single splinter from a shell that happened to land about a hundred yards from him. It, I have no doubt that the eye was slight, and it was an extremely good shot. I suppose it was rough justice. Two or three days earlier, when at the observation post, I snagged the party of about ten men, and the shell landed in the middle of it. A few minutes later, I saw a van coming down the road, and I nearly gave an order to fire again. But just in time, I saw a small red cross on the side of the van. To return to the shell, which was obviously aimed at me, it must have burst on the left side under my horse. His body saved me from death and even from serious injury. I had two flesh wounds in the leg, one very large, Four in the left arm, one in the other, that has left me with a weakened tent. And finally, the stream of blood came from a channel cut in my skull without actually penetrating it. And now I'm convinced that it was caused by my wearing a tin hat. The hat had disappeared, but there seemed little doubt that a shell fragment cut through the chin strap and was deflected down onto my head. This blow on my head paralyzed the right side of my body. That, for a time, was rather alarming, but before long, life began to return. And I have never recovered the sensitivity in the fingers of my right hand. The only one of my eight wounds that had left me with serious disability was the piece of shell in my left elbow, now rigidly fixed at a right angle with a lifeless arm and nerve. I don't think I have any just cause to complain, except perhaps about a telegram received by my poor mother reporting particulars of my wound. Using the words, head, arms, legs, severe. I've not yet finished my journey from the line, have I? 
I remember being taught that the RAMC had what was called casualty clearing stations, but I don't remember going to one. I may be wrong, but my recollection is that it was from the main dressing station that I was taken in a hospital train to the base hospital at Ardeal. The train was a bit rough, with only army blankets and a pillow, and we were lying on bunks. It was a blessed relief after bumping along in that ancient ambulance. I arrived in that view late at night. My stretcher was deposited on the ground, and I was shivering with a high temperature, my all of us decided which ward I should go to. I was put to bed with hot bottles. At about 11 p.m., a surgeon came and told the sister to take me to the theatre at midnight. I had never had an operation, and I was past care. I had three operations in less than a week. And I have a few vivid memories of the operating table. On the first occasion, lying flat on my back on the table, my spirits were given delight for uplift, and I opened my eyes to see sweet, sympathetic faces of nurses standing around the table. On the third occasion, the anesthetist had the opposite effect. And by that time, I was saturated with ether. And before he started, I said, I'm tired of this. His reply, as he clapped on the mask, was, So am I. I can't blame him. But they were having to work extremely long hours. Casualties were very heavy. The Times the newspaper had a daily list of officers, and my name on the 23rd of October was one of about 240, and they were only the officers. How many other ranks? I have always been deeply grateful to the surgeon who performed the third operation of my father who was on duty in France at the time he came to see me in hospital, that I had been sent to the theatre for my arm to be amputated. But he decided to give it another chance to drain it. He saved my arm. <laughs>